Okay, so got all the sort of the boilerplate um, schematic drawn out here. There's bound to be an aerial coil here, and uh, I probably could have done this power supply area more completely, but until I actually see exactly how it's drawn up, I didn't see any point in going any further than that. So that that's typically how I do it. It just makes life easier to have a starting point rather than try and scribble things in. So, where to next? We can follow the aerial wire in, and the aerial wire is tied up in a knot here at the top and wrapped around these other wires. Uh, in fact, there's a bit of string tied through two holes on the chassis that sort of holds that down. Now, I don't know if that's factory or if someone's added it after the fact. It looks like it's been there a long time. That's an interesting way to do it. Um, and then, like I said, they're tied in a knot up here. The aerial wire comes in and, uh, whether you can see it or not, but there is an aerial coil just in here, tucked in behind the tuning gang, that has, uh, it's a wooden former and it's got a little half round. I'll see if I can get a photo of that. Okay, so uh, now the tabs on that half round piece of tag strip on the top there look to be coloured. One of the things I'll typically do is draw little diagrams of aerial coils and the wiring for them. This is where my coloured pens get called to action. Okay, and so you can see I've drawn it. Hopefully you can see the coloured tabs I've put in there as well. Actually the focus is probably appalling at that distance. Uh, that may help. I apologise if I was out of focus before. So that will help me later on. It will also help anyone else later on trying to work on the set. So if I follow the aerial wire in, That comes to the yellow tab, and the earth wire in goes to the red tab. So that tells me, knowing again, knowing typically how these are drawn, uh, that tells me that yellow and red are the aerial coil and black and green are the coupling coils, so I can draw that in. The coupling coil into the first stage is going to be black and green. Now black has a 0.05 to ground, so that's probably going to be the bottom end of the coil. And green has a green wire. The green wires typically get used to tuning caps. So I can see where that goes. All right, it's going to be. It's going to take a little bit of tracing that one. That's the one I think it is. All right, we'll come back to that one. Alright, so we've got the solid wire here, uh, which is to the end one, which is the green one. So that goes to the tuning gang. So um, one side of the tuning gang, and also to uh, this wire here, down to the grid of the mixer. So that's going to go into pin 6, which I've inexplicably drawn. Uh, sorry, no, it's not 6 is the plate for the thing. Wakey, wakey.
Okay. The other side has a 0.05 to ground, which I'm suspecting is going to be the AVC, uh, AVC, AGC. That is going to link across through probably a 2 or a 2.2 meg resistor up to the first audio. Okay, so that's a cap we're going to have to change. And I think that covers most of what I need to know on the top side. So if we flip over now, crusty piece of framing timber that I keep for balancing sets upside down. I'm going to try and hold this in a slightly more visible fashion for anyone that's watching this. As I say, it's very interesting standing here talking to myself. I, I, <laughs> I do occasionally talk to myself. Um, another channel I watch, B. Anderson TV, I was watching one of his videos the other day and somebody had asked him who are you talking to in your videos? Um, and it was it was interesting watching him trying to figure out who he was talking to and, and I don't know who I'm talking to. I could well be talking to no one. I could be making this video for my own nefarious purposes and no one else will ever see it. If you're watching, well done. Okay, I've uh, reverse engineered what we've got here, and I have never seen anything like it. Um, I don't know if this is how the circuit was from factory. I suspect not. Um, <laughs> I can kind of see what they've done, but it's not making a whole lot of sense to me. Uh, the one thing that I missed, uh, and I'm sure... There were people out there screaming at their computer screens, going, dumbass. There's two output transformers, and I'm assuming that the one on the chassis is an output transformer um, because of the, the wiring style. It has blue wires on one side and then heavy gauge wires on the other. It looks like an output transformer. So what I'm going to do shortly is actually see if I can make out a part number on that and then go back and have a look in my um, Beacon and ATC who were the, new, the two main New Zealand transform manufacturers back in the day. Uh, I'll have a look through their catalogues and see if I can find the part number and just see exactly what that transformer is. But um, it's very, very odd as um, like if you've... If you've worked on vintage radios, then you'll probably wonder what's going on here. It looks like they've used the primary side of the output transformer as a choke. Um, I'm not quite sure how well long term that would stand up to. I'm going to cut all this out. Um, this just makes no sense to me to have it like this. I have found a roller speaker an EM speaker. Uh, I'll test that in a minute and see if it's uh, see if it's actually working still. Make sure that none of the, the windings have gone open circuit. But uh, this just it, it makes no sense to me at all. So I'm going to put it back to what I'd considered to be a fairly standard typical design of the day which is what I had drawn um, in my sort of template that I started with and that had then confused me um, and I started to redraw what I was seeing. I've completely missed there's a whole second output transformer stage here um, because the speaker has its own output transformer on it. What the second stage is doing I'm not quite sure. Um, why the cap across it 
Um, it's a thousand volt cap which it probably needs to be given its position across a, a secondary winding like that. Um, but what value it is I can't see the the actual cluster itself is this horrible little black one here and it is pretty munted um, as most of these black style caps tend to be by the time you, you see them today um, the body's all melted there's I can see a thousand and what looks like part of a V just there I can't really make anything else other than the top of a, a one so you might almost I suspect it could be a 0.1 thousand volt or a 0.01 thousand volt you see yeah it does look like it possibly says 0 0.1 just on the edge of where it's starting to get all melted and horrible there so um, I can't make sense of this Repairs back in the day would have been done to use what parts they had and get a set up and running again. That, that's not uncommon. Um, hearing people complain on vintage radio forums that what a hacky job the last person in the radio did. That's also not uncommon. Um, I suspect those people are restorers with more time on their hands than probably the serviceman who was putting food on his table by doing this job. Had. Um, so I can understand that if this is what they had and they had to get the job done that may have been the thinking but it's it's interesting I mean the radio seems to work the voltages don't seem to be horrible um, I didn't scope the HT to see what the HT looks like but I imagine it's fine uh, could I leave it like this and just leave it as part of its story? I probably could. Do I want to? I really don't. Um, I don't think this is how it would have been from factory. Surely not. Certainly not by the late 30s. I think by the late 30s the, the design of power supply stages in these simple sets was fairly standard. Um, you came out of the rectifier into a cap, through the field winding, another cap, and that was your HT. Let's get this out of the way for a moment. Bring in this roller speaker. I'll zoom you in on that. So, see if we can work out what's going on here. This is a replacement transformer. Um, it's got the same horrible cloth tape covering the joints as the as the power cord and the radio has. Looks like it was a push-pull transformer. They've just taped off the center tap, uh, which means this could be 10k or higher, which might be too high. Um, so we'll just have a wee. But I would have expected that to have shown some resistance. See it's got a bit of surface rust and I'm probably not even going to bother cleaning that off. The earth lug there wires been cut. This electromag speaker has had, well, the cabinet's had borer in it. The borer have gone right into the speaker surround. So I may just soak that speaker surround. Um, and a bit of methylated spirits or something shouldn't damage the cardboard but it should just ensure that any little bugs or gremlins that are still living in here are gone okay so I've tidied this up um, put this cord on it because there is a socket in that chassis for a four pin standard four pin cord um, that is the transformer I went with 
So that's reading fine. Um, field coil is reading just under 2.5k, which is where it should be. Um, heat shrinking here is a little bit untidy. The only stuff I had was either way too big or just not quite uh, big enough to get over that scruffy mess and I didn't want to peel any back because this wire is really old and if I had to retin it that was going to cause extra nightmares so I may come back and try and tidy this up later <laughs> I probably won't but if it's working it's working I've also taken this bracket which was on here off um, because we don't need it and it may actually get in the way I'm not quite sure how much room we're going to have once we put all this back in the cabinet so at this point I've got a speaker ready to go and so now I'm going to rip the power supply apart in the chassis and rebuild that and I'll be back with you okay um, change of mind thought I will just bring you along for the ride so uh, I'll probably put this on fast forward uh, unless I don't in which case you'll get to watch the whole thing in real time uh, but there will probably be some mumbling and musing as I go along so real time might not be the best idea okay I'm not going to need that anymore. Um, I'm not going to need these anymore. This is just awful. Now, normally I wouldn't just rip shit and bust into this like this. Um, I'll typically do one component at a time. And a trick I learned from John from Arkansas, Joe and on, on YouTube, uh, if I remember or I can figure out how, I'll stick a link to his channel down below. I was talking about how it's really easy to be changing a component and the phone rings and you wander off and then you come back and you've got no idea where that component came from. If you cut it out and you stick a clippy lead where the component went, and if you're really paranoid about it, you could stick a wee label on here and put the value of the component you took out. Um, and just take off one end as you put the component in, take the other end off as you finish it. That way you're not going to forget where that component came from. And if you're only doing one component at a time, which is you know, probably recommended, then uh, you should have no problems. So... Thank John for that one, but as I'm basically tearing all of this out and starting again, we'll not worry too much about that one. So I know that this point 0.1 is just a point 0.1 to ground. It'd be interesting to take this out and have a look. See if I can work out what the brand is. Is it Aerovox? It looks like it's just got a logo and no, no name. And get some of this wax out of the way. No, I can't make that out, but um, if anybody recognizes that logo, which hopefully will focus, whoever that is, let us know, would you? Alright. So that's a large part of the power supply stuff out of the way. We've got this one here as well. I'm going to try and have a wee read of this. It looks like 0 0.1, but it's really hard to tell. One of the leads has let go. That could have been me, of course. But it's garbage. I'll do this without melting my fingers. Melt them, I probably will, though. Really typical. Okay. Alright, so at this point things are starting to make a little bit more sense. Um, <laughs> and I'm feeling a little bit more like an idiot. So that is not a transformer, it's just a choke. So that would have been put on 
simply to replace the field coil in the power supply circuit, uh, which makes all of this make a little bit more sense now, um, and me just feel a little bit sillier that I didn't pick that up. I saw the four wires under there and went, ah, four wires. But in fact the two wires going to the speaker were just going under the transformer, they weren't going into it. Um, so, great, alright, well that makes a lot more sense now, so the uh, the transformer that I thought was there Hopefully that'll focus. So the secondary winding here that I thought I had doesn't actually um, exist and that capacitor is just across here uh, which makes sense as a tone compensator. It's probably not a 0.1 but um, maybe a 0.01, 0.05, something like that. So right, in which case perfectly sensible power supply here and everything makes a little bit more sense. Everyone out there that was screaming at me about that, you can stop screaming now. I've figured it out. I've caught up with the rest here. Rectifier socket, um, stripped of everything we don't need. Speaker socket, not quite yet, but getting there. Uh, we've got two these two speaker wires actually run through here, so I'm just going to cut those off. Um, so the center tap for the HT is connected to this strap, which is bizarre. It doesn't look like a very good earth point for, you know, by any stretch of the imagination, um, although it does have a wire running from this earth point on the side of the chassis down to it and then that wire runs back over rather inexplicably wraps once around the screw holding the transformer in but is not connected in any particular way and then to another earthing point on the chassis here uh, which looks like it could be a bit of a copper strap that's been spot welded onto it or even a bit of steel strap that's been spot welded onto the chassis itself so that looks like a proper earth this looks like a bodge earth, and this just looks like an appalling earth. So actually, I'm going to probably take this out, because it's not doing anything, it's just in the way, really. A lot more space to work in here now. Um, what I'm probably going to do is... Uh, go with what was in there, which was two 16s. Nearest thing I'll have is two 15s, so I'll just grab grab my stash. Now these are 500 volt, which should be okay. Uh, particularly in the electros, I like to use name brand stuff. So these are 105 degree Rubicons, which are, are good Japanese caps. Uh, I trust them, so I use them. They're a little bit more expensive and they are radial, not axial. But on tag strip, that doesn't tend to matter. I'm going to have to have one off here to ground. And I can probably mount that just direct. I'm going to take this out. That's 25 mic and a 50, so it's a 500 ohm resistor and a 25 mic. So that's the decoupling cap for the cathode of the output valve, the 6V6. This is the center tap, which needs to go back to an earth, so it can either come up here or it can go down there. I'm thinking probably down there because that's where I'll stick the uh, earth for the first cap. And then I'm going to want to tie over to the field coil, which is the two larger holes, which I think are these two here. Um, so that's tied to that tag strip. So if I keep that tag strip in place, I can just run a tie wire from here to here and that'll go into the field coil, come out of the field coil here and then from there I'll need to go to a um, another earth with the second cap, uh, which may be easier said than done. So maybe actually the tie wire rather from here to here, if I bring it from here over to here, 
I can bring uh, the field coil out through that one, back in through this one, and then put the second cap on here down to the earth. So the other thing I'm doing that may be of some interest is um, there was a news article on last night about uh, a guy up in the North Island who was printing face shields for the uh, epidemic and saying there was a group of makers that were doing it. Now I just happened to have a 3D printer. I hadn't heard anything about it. I try and actually keep clear of the news at the moment. So first I heard was last night that there's uh, makers all over the country making these face shields for medical staff to use. There's people saying that essential health workers don't have the safety gear that they need and um, you know whether that's the case or not there's a, a group that's banded together and they've uh, started printing face shields as another company that's laser cutting the actual shield part and then the headband section is being uh, 3D printed and uh, there's a, an elastic band that goes around the back to hold it on your head so I um, joined that group last night, got my first email with the printer files this morning and, and have started printing those so it'll be interesting to see Apparently there's a demand for thousands of these things, or requests for thousands. Uh, I can't remember what it was, like 7,000 they've had requested, plus another 25,000. I don't recall. It was a big number of, we'll take some if you've got leftovers. So, uh, yeah, jumped on that. The 3D printer's just sitting inside, spitting out a, a big stack of them at the moment. So we'll see how that goes. Kind of nice to be doing something, I guess. I'll bring you in for a better view shortly. I'm not quite sure how the guys that do this get a camera right over their shoulder. My tripod's certainly not long enough to reach over my shoulder. This is a standing bench and I'm 6'5", so um, the bench itself is quite high as well. So I've just got a wee tripod sitting on the bench beside me. It may not be quite as good. Actually, let's try and move it. How's that? Can you see? I'll probably forget where I've got you pointed. You're in a little bit closer now. Hopefully I'm not going to melt anything because my soldering iron's just here as well. Um, so, rectifiers here, this pin, put this onto this pin, come down to this earth tag here, first one can sit there. Losing two minds about crimping wires on. It does make for a nice mechanical contact. The solder's really just holding it in position. But uh, the next service person to come in here and try and replace those is probably going to swear at me a little bit. Alright, so what I've got is the uh, meter hooked up to the B plus line and I've plugged it in. I've checked everything, just the power supply rebuilt and the decoupling, uh, or the cathode bypass rather, uh, on the output that I replaced a bit earlier on. So everything else is still as it was. It was working before, so all I'm doing now is checking to see whether the power supply repairs I've done are functioning and whether the set still works. Meter's hooked up across B+, speaker is plugged into the plug on the chassis. Uh, I've checked to make sure that's wired correctly, I've checked the set to make sure it's wired correctly, so barring any unforeseen catastrophes, it should work. Either that or it's going to blow my arm off and you'll see it somewhere on a Darwin's Award blooper reel. Promising. You see that voltage climb to around 500 volts and then that should drop back down again. Um, now that's why these caps need to be rated for at least 500 volts. They don't run at 500 but when you first switch them on cold 
they'll come up to 500 and then drop back. 450 volt caps, not a good idea here. Right, B plus is about 250. No signal. Although we're picking something up. Uh, if I throw the sig gen up around 600. dodgy connection there somewhere. I'm now going to fire the set up again. Nothing's swelling, nothing's going kaboom. So that's working. We're sitting at about 245 volts on the HT line, which is exactly where I'd expect it to be. I'm just going to check before the field coil. I expect it's going to be quite a bit higher. Yep, 316. So that's the voltage before the field coil, and the 245 is after the field coil. So that's doing exactly what I'd expect it to do. Now, the other thing you'll notice. And here is I've tagged a little 0 0.01 thousand volt cap across the output transformer. And I've done that to check what difference that's going to make. It's really common to see one there either across the transformer or from the plate to ground uh, as some kind of tone compensation cap. So I'm just going to use something insulated, my handy dandy pen. Hopefully you can hear. Takes away a lot of the top end hiss, which when you've got a lot of hiss is a good thing. About if you know what I mean. Asking a very simple question. Do you think that sport with no spectators is better than no sport at all? We've had a huge response to this on the text machine. Here's one. Martin. Yes, right. yes, yes. They're having a go at lockdown competition. Not a huge difference in vocal. RL, that would be ideal. Just get it up and running. The good old days are gone. These... Right. I don't want to play too much more music than that for obvious reasons, but hopefully you got a quick glimpse of the, the tone effect coming in now. So um, at this stage I'm happy that everything's working and we've got sensible HT voltages in there. I'm quite happy to carry on with the rest of the set now as it's working exactly as it should. Well hi everyone. Thanks again for watching. Uh, this is the end of part two. The video is getting quite long again. I'm going to need to get considerably better at not waffling and maybe editing a little bit more brutally. There's uh, probably about four hours of video that I condensed into half an hour, so I did chop it down quite a bit. But it's quite obvious I waffle way too much while I'm filming, so I think I probably need to sort that out. But for now, this is part two. Part three will be coming out hopefully tomorrow or the next day. I'm working on it now. So again, thanks for watching. And if you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. Cheers.